Hey guys, in this video, the lovely Tim is going to be talking to you about government in other countries as part of your GCSE citizenship revision. Now, there are lots of facts and details and technical bits that you need to get right in this video. So to help you with that, over on my website, there are loads of multiple choice questions just waiting for you. There are many different types of government found around the world and no single way to classify all of them. However, these are some of the types of government that you may see represented to you in an exam, either in terms of a source question or in just in terms of terminology that you should already know. Democracy is the government through elected representatives. It's the type of government that we're familiar with here in the UK and is the model of government for much of the Western world, especially Western Europe and North America. Examples of countries with a democratic type of government include the UK, France, Iceland, Australia and Canada. Democracies tend to have a very high regard for human, individual and civil rights. A theocracy is a government through religious rule. This was the case for much of history for many countries, where religion was the primary force of rule. Often, religion was used to prop up a monarchy. There are very few examples of religious rule currently around the world. Many countries have a religious element to their rulers, but Iran is currently the only country with a completely religious basis. Although there are elements of democracy in Iran, the foundation of its government is theocracy. It is an Islamic republic. Other countries also identify as, Isla as Islamic republics. However, Iran is definitely the most extreme example. A dictatorship is the government through the authority of a single figure whose authority is unchallenged. They are the, di the dictator and their will goes. Often dictatorships are a direct opposite to democracy with little regard for human, individual or civil rights. Often, these dictatorships are brutal and repressive and will carry out human rights violations in order to enforce the authority of that single figure. Russia is heading towards an increasingly more authoritarian and dictatorship style of government. Since the end of the Cold War, Belarus has maintained the dictatorship which was there through it. North Korea is probably the best, best example of a dictatorship. While North Korea is theoretically a communist one-party state, in actual fact it is a dictatorship under a single figure. Monarchy is the type of government also familiar to many people through much of history. While Britain is technically a monarchy, we are a constitutional monarchy where democracy is the form of government and the Queen is predominantly a figurehead or symbolic figure. There are still monarchies around the world and they tend to be around the Middle East and Gulf, places like Saudi Arabia, Brunei and the United Arab Emirates. While they sometimes include a democratic element, democracy in these places can be limited and their regard for human, civil and legitimate rights is limited and variable. Communism is a type of government familiar through most of the 20th century. Indeed, the Cold War from 1945 through to about 1990 was dominated by the struggle between communism and capitalism and democracy and communism. Communism is a single party style of government with communism as the social and economic model. If you look back to the video that we did on ideologies, you can see a greater explanation of communism. There are few communist countries left in the world. China, Cuba and Vietnam are the most prominent examples. However, even in these cases, they have reformed communism to an extent to allow elements of democracy or capitalism. We can take a useful case study in the USA and compare it with government in the UK. There are several similarities. Like the UK, the USA is a democracy. It has a bicameral legislature. A House of Representatives, equivalent to our House of Commons, consisting of a larger number of elected representatives. And a Senate. However, in the UK, the House of Lords is unelected, comprising mostly appointed peers, some hereditary peers, and a small number of bishops. In the US, the Senate is elected, two senators per state, which are elected. The, like us, the USA has a first-past-the-post electoral system, where in each state, the party getting the largest number of votes receives that state's points in the Electoral College. It has a democratic form of government. There are, however, several differences. In the UK, the Queen is the head of state, whereas the Prime Minister is the head of government, and those roles are not combined. In the US, this is not the case. The President is both the head of state and head of government. Unlike in the UK, there are term limits on a President. A President may not serve more than two four-year terms. In the UK, there are no formal, legal term limits on a Prime Minister. If they are able to continue commanding the confidence of the House of Commons, they may go on for as long as possible. Margaret Thatcher, for example, was there for 10 years, slightly over in fact, Tony Blair also. Unlike the UK, the USA has almost entirely a two-party system, a Democratic Party representing theoretically the centre and centre-left of politics, and a Republican Party representing the moderate and centre-right. There are smaller parties in the US, but they have not really got any political traction, even on a local level. 
in the UK, smaller parties such as the Liberal Democrats, Greens, SNP, Plaid Cymru are common. They have quite a lot of representation, especially at a local level. China is another useful case study in comparison with the UK. There are some, although few, similarities. Their government is organised into departments, as is the case in the UK. There is the presence of local government, and there is the presence of devolution, for example, to Hong Kong. Although, whereas devolution in the UK is widespread and an accepted factor in politics, devolution in China is controversial and limited to specific areas. Devolution also, as we have seen recently in Hong Kong, is very much under threat in China. Unlike the UK, China is a single-party communist state with very limited democracy. If you are voting, you are voting for the Communist Party. There is little respect, or at least limited respect, for human rights in China. While the Chinese government would argue that it does prioritise human rights, especially economically, there is not the same respect for civil and individual liberty as one finds in a democratic system. There is therefore little democratic oversight of government, whereas in the UK, the opposition parties will carry out holding the government to account. When you have no opposition party, it is limited to the extent to which that is possible. There are, of course, many ways to measure the effectiveness of governments, none of which are uncontroversial, and all of which are subjective. However, the main method used is the Human Development Index, which is calculated usually by the UN. This is often known as the HDI, and it is what is known as a composite measurement, meaning it takes into account many different factors. In particular, the main ones are life expectancy, which is in itself a composite measurement of things like healthcare, the spread of disease, the number of doctors, and the extent to which those doctors are trained. Education standards, how well and if the populace is educated. This also takes into account things like school leaving age, which varies wildly in different countries. In the UK, we are used to the idea of children leaving school at 16 or 18. However, in many countries, it can be much younger. Literacy rate, which is almost 100% in many countries, does vary wildly across the world, being as little as 30% in some. This is therefore also taken into account. Healthcare levels, which is part of life expectancy, is also taken into account. Lastly, income, usually measured through GDP, the gross domestic product of a country, is a useful economic measure. Many people, however, would argue that GDP is not a great measurement, as it only really measures, in terms of gross domestic product, the physical value of physical goods. Many countries have an economy which is diversified into a service sector, things like banking and broadband provision, and therefore GDP is less relevant. This also takes into account things like inequality and how unequal a country is. Combining all of these gives you a decimal value from zero, the lowest, to one, the highest. Many countries get very close to one, although reaching it is almost impossible. Not that many countries get close to zero, the lowest being about 0.35. As a general rule, countries above about 0.75 are considered to be highly developed. Countries below 0.5 are considered to have a low level of development, and those between 0.5 and 0.75 fall in the middle. Norway is a useful case study, having currently almost the highest human development index, or HDI, at 0.954, regarded as very high. Norway has extremely high education and healthcare standards, aided by the fact that it has a low population spread over a large area. This means it has a large economy based around natural resources and the service sector, giving it a high GDP. Inequality is very limited in Norway as a result of high taxation on high earnings. The high education standards result in very high literacy rates, approaching 100%, as is the case in many Western European and North American nations. There are low levels of disease due to a proficient healthcare system, which further increases the HDI. Norway is a classic example of a country with a very high human development index. Other case studies would include countries like Iceland, Austria, Germany, Australia and New Zealand. It's worth for an exam having a few of these countries ready. A useful counterexample of low human development index is that of South Sudan, which became an independent nation after splitting from Sudan itself a few years ago. South Sudan has a human development index of 0.413, which is classed as being low or very low. And there are many reasons for this. South Sudan is almost a failed state. It has very, very limited health care provision with few doctors and little facilities. It has a limited education system with many children either not attending education or leaving education very early to go into work. Its limited natural resources and turbulent population give it a low gross domestic product or GDP. This is compounded by frequent ethnic tensions leading to potential civil war. There is high inequality with a large mass of low income people in a high level of poverty and a very small number of high income people. 
there is high disease and illness levels as a result of the very limited healthcare provision. Diseases, especially tropical diseases such as malaria and HIV, are rampant. This leads to a very low life expectancy, which further reduces the HDI of South Sudan. Because of the limited education system, many people are illiterate, unable to write or read, especially their own name, which is the measure which is used usually for literacy rates. This usually results in human development index falling even further, as is indeed the case in South Sudan. Overall, therefore, South Sudan has a very low human development index. As with high HDI countries, it's useful to have a few case studies rather than just the one. I would suggest also looking at places like Chad and Niger. One notable factor is that most of the countries with very low human development indexes are in Africa, whereas most of the ones with very high human development indexes are in Western Europe.